you to the organizers for inviting me to give this mini course and thank you all for being here. So I'm going to talk about uh, countable subgroups of, uh, so two groups that we've already encountered. So uh, Omeo plus R, which, because uh, I, <clears throat> I prefer to think about compact manifolds when possible. Uh, by taking the uh, two point compactification, this is uh, really replace this by um, homeo of the interval and of uh, homeo plus of, of the circle. And okay, so of course, now we know that countable subgroups of these objects are characterized by left order ability and circular order ability. So we won't uh, revisit that uh, at all. We'll just take that as axiomatic for now. And so uh, <clears throat> what I'm really going to be spending most of the uh, uh, this mini course talking about is a more dynamical perspective on uh, on groups or subgroups of of these two very large groups, especially from the point of view of analysis, and particularly what I want to think about is uh, the effects of regularity, which uh, for me will almost always mean differentiability unless I say anything else. So. Where can we start to, to motivate this? Well, <clears throat> so it uh, so Ty did me the, uh, the favor of of introducing the rotation number of a homeomorphism of S one. So for F in uh, homeo plus S one, you have this thing, uh, the rotation number of F, which itself is an element of S1, right? So the precise definition, which I won't uh, write on the board again, is will you lift F, uh, take an arbitrary lift to the universal cover of S1, and you look at the asymptotic translation length, always exists by general methods. And then you take the, res uh, the resulting real number and reduce it mod Z. And the uh, the thing you get is an element of of the circle group, which is implicitly uh, <laughs> identified with R mod Z. So now, if you look at uh, the possible values of the rotation number, so the rotation number can either be rational or irrational, and for actual rotations of the circle, the rotational uh, rotation number is exactly uh, the angle through which you are uh, uh, through which you're rotating suitably normalized. Okay. So the basic question is, okay, so if you look at uh, theta and say R mod Z is irrational. Right? And if you have some some F, in homeo plus of S1, and you compute the rotation number of F is equal to, to theta. So does this imply that F is conjugate to say the rotation by theta? This is the rotation by, by theta. So of course it may not be equal to the rotation by theta on the nose because you can change coordinates. You can uh, conjugate by your favorite homeomorphism of S1 and then you get something which is not equal to a rotation, but it's, you know, by changing coordinates, I mean, it is. So does it follow that, uh, that, that if you have an irrational rotation number, then uh, you are topologically conjugate to a rotation. And the answer to this 
that it depends on, on the regularity of, of F. Right. So in other words, sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. Okay. So there are examples of, of uh, Denjois, which uh, are often, oh, well, they go, actually go back to Bull, uh, which give examples of, uh, of homeomorphisms with rotation uh, numbers that are, that are irrational, but no dense orbits. So if you take an irrational rotation on the circle and you take any point and you follow its itinerary around the circle as you iterate the rotation, you're going to meet every open subset. Uh, and so that's that's actually something stronger than the existence, existence of a dense orbit. That's something called minimality. And there are even stronger things that are true in this case, which I'll, I'll mention later on. I mean, the, there's a... Uh, for an irrational rotation, the Lebesgue measure on the circle is a unique invariant measure in fact, for an irrational rotation. But <clears throat> now if you look at what the what Denjois and Bull are telling you, is that you can construct examples where the uh, <clears throat> where you don't have dense orbits. So I won't explain in complete detail. How to, how to produce such examples, but one thing you can do is you take your favorite orbit of an actual irrational rotation, okay, and you replace each point in the orbit by an interval. And this, this is a, a you've, the orbit itself is countable. Okay? And so you take a countable collection of lengths whose, uh, whose sum converges. And then you, you, what you do is you, if one point is related to another by a, by a power of the rotation, then you take the interval corresponding to replacing one of those to the, inter, the next interval, and you identify them by maybe an affine map that scales lengths appropriately. And it's not very difficult to see that the result, the resulting space given in by, given by gluing in all these uh, all these intervals is in fact again homeomorphic to the circle but the fact that you're not no longer conjugate to an irrational rotation is is immediate because you just take you know, any one of these intervals there the interiors are wandering in the sense that you live in one of these interiors for one second and you never come back for any any power of the rotation so that you never a point in, in in the interior of one of these intervals never returns to that interior under any iteration okay so there's quite a bit of heavy lifting which was done by this remark that i made kind of offhandedly about affine maps identifying the two consecutive intervals so if you then Think about well, what what? Like, how do those affine maps glue together? Well, most of the time, the slopes of those affine maps will not glue together in a way that's that's differentiable. So that the, the slopes will almost never agree in such a way that, that that the resulting map is differentiable. Nevertheless, if one is more careful in choosing uh, what the you know, maps identifying consecutive intervals are and a little bit careful about what the lengths of those intervals are, then one can prove the following. So that there, in fact, uh, there exists C1, uh, I'll just say, right, uh, diffeomorphisms of, of S1, which are uh, irrational rotation number and uh, not conjugate. So these are commonly known as Genjois cover examples. Yeah. But then uh, a theorem which uh, will go beyond the scope of what I can cover in this mini course is that if you bump up the regularity more, 
for example, to twice differentiable uh, diffeomorphisms, then no such examples exist anymore. So I'll write, the, uh, I'll have a notation like this. So F is in bit two plus of S. So this means twice differentiable orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of the circle. F is conjugate to a rotation. And so there's some very deep relationship between how particular homeomorphisms can behave dynamically and the level of regularity with which they act. I'll note that this conjugacy, by the way, usually is not within if two. It's in fact, usually, you usually need to do it in, inside of homeo, even if you assume things like F is C infinity. But yeah, so the, the <clears throat> so finding this the actual conjugacy is is by no means a trivial thing. <clears throat> okay. So irrational rotations, I mean these uh, these are elements of the homeomorphism of S one with infinite order. I mean they all give you abstract copies of of the cyclic group of integers. So what I'll consider now with this sort of motivation that you know, things, the behavior of, of subgroups or behavior of elements at least inside of uh, homeo of, of S1 depends on regularity, that may affect algebra in some non-trivial and interesting way. Okay, so uh, for the first few lectures, I'll consider uh, some of my uh, favorite groups. So the first will be no potent groups. The, uh, I'll always assume are, are torsion free and finitely generated. Things called uh, right angled Artin groups. So for those who uh, may not have heard of these before, so these are defined by, by a graph, gamma, finite, uh, finite. Uh, simple graphs, so no, no doubled edges and no loops uh, at, at base at a single vertex um, with vertices V and edges E. And then uh, the right angled art group on um, gamma is generated by the vertices and, and two vertices commute. Um, if and only if E and W span an edge. Why these are interesting uh, will, I hope, be communicated in the uh, near future. Uh, and third is, is um, mapping class groups of, of compact orientable surfaces. So these were also very kindly defined by Ty already. So if, uh, if sigma is such a surface, then the mapping class group of sigma is uh, usually taken to be orientation preserving homeomorphisms of sigma up to isotopy. So, Thomas, yes, you said this is some of your favorite groups. Are they ordered by? <laughs> I was surprised that you started with Neil Potter. Uh, <laughs> with right angle mapping that groups. Uh, in no particular order. <laughs> but thank you for the uh, uh, for the observation. Um, <laughs> so uh, my interest changed with the wind. So okay, so. All three of these groups, the classes of groups uh, appropriately interpreted, uh, <clears throat> act by homeomorphisms on the interval and on the circle. So a little bit of care is required in the third case. But let me give some indications of why. Uh, so just to set up our discussion. So for nilpotent groups, uh, one can oftentimes uh, exhibit explicit orders. So uh, for a torsion-free nilpotent group, one uh, 
one can use the fact that every such nilpotent group is an iterated central extension of, by finitely generated abelian groups, which are torsion free. And the fact that the conjugation action on some successive quotients in what's called the lower central series is trivial. And so any order then is automatically uh, that, you, that you choose on one of those quotients is automatically conjugation invariant. And so uh, uh, as a particular example that I might do is take something like the Heisenberg group H, uh, which is, uh, has the following presentation. Right, so you take three generators and, and the commutator of X and Y is equal to Z and Z is central. And so we have this nice uh, <clears throat> short exact sequence that looks like this. Right? So this uh, central copy of Z is generated by little Z. I should make that bigger. Right? And then uh, this Z is generated by the images of X and Y when you declare Z to be the identity. So, uh, so now choose your favorite order here, okay? And choose your favorite order here. HZ is, is orderable. In fact, that proves it's bi-orderable because the, uh, the conjugation action on, uh, of, of HZ on the center is trivial. And so any order that you choose here is automatically conjugation invariant. So I think that's possibly the, the uh, easiest way to see that torsion-free nilpotent groups act faithfully by homeomorphisms on the interval and on, on the circle. So I, I gave this particular argument for HZ, but it, it, this generalizes without much difficulty. So for right-angled Arden groups, one can one could follow the same path. So one could say, well, if you know enough about the combinatorics of right-angled Arden groups and their, their combinatorial group theory, then you will you might know that if you take an arbitrary non-trivial element in a right-angled Arden group, then it survives inside of a, a tangent to a torsion-free nilpotent group. Okay. And so then. If you, uh, so then you just, you know, have this sort of di direct a map from the right angled Arden group to a direct product of torsion free nilpotent groups. So the right angled Arden group is residually torsion free nilpotent or whatever. And so you get, an, you get orders out of that for free. So I'm going to uh, elect to go a slightly different route. And to instead explicitly exhibit an action of right angled Arden groups on the interval, which is uh, which is um, uh, faithful, and which will play into my uh, my agenda of of understanding how regularity affects things. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'll I'll show you an explicit faithful action uh, of the free group on two generators, which with just some combinatorial manipulations generalizes to arbitrary right angled Arden groups. So all right, uh, a, sub a of gamma will be the free group on two generators, which is generated by A and B, okay? And I can pretend that I'm acting on the real line and not just on the interval. It's just the interior. Okay. And so what I need to do is I need to show that I have an action where every non-trivial element of the free group acts by some homeomorphism that is not the identity. Great. Well, let's say I have my favorite word inside of the right angle, uh, inside of um, the free group. Okay. Maybe it's... Um, a inverse B inverse uh, A squared B. 
cubed. Let's just pretend that it's that. Uh, it's not my favorite word. I, my favorite word is something else. <laughs> <laughs> is somewhere in the top three ranking? No, it's not even close. <laughs> uh, okay, so how might we uh, <clears throat> exhibit uh, some action where this particular word acts by something that is not the identity? Well, uh, let's uh, let's pick a point here, X. I'll find you an action of the free group on some compact interval inside of the real line where W takes X off of itself. Okay. And because I can find count, uh, count, uh, countably many disjoint compact intervals inside of the real line, then I can build such an action for every element of the free group. And therefore I get an, by combining those actions by a direct product construction, I get a faithful action of the real, of the free group on the real line. So, uh, so the first, uh, let's you know, let's say I'm, I'm acting on the wrong side. So I'm acting on the right. So so A inverse acts first. Okay. So then I just take some <laughs> interval like this. So uh, what I mean by by this arc is that on this interval uh, that's bounded by this point and this point, A moves everything to the left. So if you wanted to, you could write something like that down in coordinates. You could make it smooth. You can make it even piecewise linear if you wanted to. Okay. And you can make like, so in this case, A inverse, move X anywhere you want it to move to the right within, this, within the interior of this interval. So let's say I move X like 99% of the way across here. Here's, you know, this is A inverse of X. And now the next letter is B inverse. So I make sure that the B interval that I choose, B is gonna, is basically the same, same picture. So I have, uh, I just want the uh, left endpoint of this B interval to have A inverse X to the right of it. And I rig, the action of B to be such that B inverse A inverse X ends up over here. And now, now, now I can take this next A interval to be disjoint from this first one. And so there's no collision of definitions. So now I declare A to be moving things this way. So now here's you know, A square, uh, uh, I've switched my right and left actions. Uh, sorry about that. So we have uh, right uh, A inverse, B inverse, A squared X is over here. And then you do the same thing with B. So A squared moves this point all the way over here. And then B cubed moves this point all the way over here. And the result is that I apply this word to X and I end up way over here, which is not X anymore. That's the certificate that this element acted non-trivially. If you want a, a fun exercise in combinatorial group theory, try to prove that this same argument works for an arbitrary right-angled Darton group. You can exhibit uh, such, a, such an action uh, that's, that's faithful of an arbitrary right-angled Darton group. And this has the following one corollary. Uh, because you know you have a lot of freedom in choosing what a these a and b homeomorphisms are, and there's no issue about like gluing together in any way. There's no definition collision. We have that um, any right-angled Artin group actually acts by C infinity to homeomorphisms of the real line. That's a compact. Great. So that's what I'll say for now about right angled art groups and why they're why they're orderable. So what about mapping class groups of surfaces? So uh, I mentioned a few issues that that come up uh, in the problem session. 
And so for one, there are problems like uh, the existence of torsion in both closed mapping classrooms where, when the underlying surface is closed and when also when it's punctured. But there's a theorem that goes back all the way to, to Nielsen in the around 1920 that says uh, if if sigma has a, a puncture, which you can equivalently think about as a marked point, then the mapping class group of, of sigma embeds into a homeo plus of the circle. Okay. And if, uh, if sigma uh, has a boundary component, mod sigma embeds into homeo plus of the interval of the real line. So let me uh, explain maybe in some more geometric detail uh, uh, why these things are true. So, uh, so this is a theorem of Nielsen. I mean, this, so there was a, there's a paper that appeared in the 80s uh, by Handel and Thurston that said new proofs of some theorems of, of Nielsen. So I'll just write Handel and Thurston here as well. Okay, while you finish erasing the board, I have a quick question. So the argument you sketched for right-angled arting group, um, so so what, what's special about right-angled arting group, I guess? Like, can you make it work for a surface group or a one-related group with a condition on the relations or something? Um, well, um, so what's special about the right-angled arting group is, is that uh, you have a, sort of very nice normal forms inside of the group. And you, you have a very good idea of how the, the word problem uh, is solved. Uh, so if you wanted to do the same thing for a surface group, one thing that you might do is to say, well, you know, the surface group sits inside of a right angle art group. And so then just by restriction, you get an action, but that's sort of cheating. Uh, <clears throat> so this particular construction that I uh, that I sketched here, I mean, what's really going on is is that I mean, there's a combination of things not commuting, which is just overlap of support, and things commuting, which is non-overlap uh, of support. And so, in some sense, the right angle Larkin groups are are perfectly suited for this kind of action in the real life. It's possible that there are generalizations to uh, things like one related groups with some nice uh, restrictions on it, but I uh, don't know. It's what you're saying. It's very difficult to, to verify the relations. I mean, it's easy to verify commuting. Yes. Three is no relation. That's right. A more complicated relation is very difficult. That, that, that's right. So I hope that answers that. Thanks. Okay, so what's going on with uh, Nielsen here? Okay, so uh, I'll first talk about maybe the, the case of a marked point because that's uh, geometrically easier to, uh, to imagine than a, than a puncture. And so, uh, so you have some surface here and here's your favorite marked point. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> if you've ever thought about hyperbolic geometry, then you, you may know that uh, <clears throat> uniformization tells you that if you have, uh, that the uh, universal cover of such a surface is naturally identified with hyperbolic space, right, which is homeomorphic to a disk, the universal covering map. The hyperbolic space is equipped with a natural boundary, the Gromov boundary. Okay. And uh, points on the Gromov boundary are naturally identified with, with endpoints of uh, ideal endpoints of geodesics if you fix some sort of hyperbolic metric on the surface sigma. And so 
uh, what you can do is if you have your favorite psi in mod sigma, you first replace this by uh, some psi, which uh, is some preimage inside of homeo plus of the sigma uh, of sigma, and then lift that to the universal cover. So this is uh, so I've just taken a mapping class, taken a homeomorphism representative, and then uh, uh, an arbitrary lift to H two. So the arbitrariness of the lift is a bit of a problem. That's why we have a marked point to begin with. So what we can do is you take a, your favorite lift of the marked point P upstairs. Uh, anyone will do. We'll just put fix it to begin with. And then the lift psi tilde that you choose will be the one that fixes P tilde. So now, uh, psi, uh, psi tilde now acts on the boundary of H2. So there's a natural extension of psi tilde to the boundary of H2. The, the fact that that exists is not obvious. It ultimately follows from something called the Morse lemma in, uh, in hyperbolic geometry. And that's, this gives you an element of homeo plus of S1. And then the last thing that one needs to show is that this depends depends only on on the homotopy class of of psi. So in particular, only on the mapping class group uh, on the on the sorry on the mapping class psi. And so what that furnishes then it is an action of this mapping class group on the circle. And it's not that difficult to show that it's in fact faithful. So that proves that the mapping class group with a marked point or puncture is circularly orderable. Now, in the case that you have a boundary component, the argument is very similar. So you also, uh, instead of you know choosing a marked point now, and a lift of that mark point to the in, uh, to the interior of hyperbolic space. What you can do is you just fix your favorite lift of the boundary. In that case, a component of the boundary will be some geodesic inside of hyperbolic space here, and you insist that all the lifts preserve this favorite lift. And then, both this part of the circle and this part of the circle are invariant under the action of the mapping class group, and that furnished as a faithful action of the mapping class with the boundary component on the real line. That's sort of a, an explanation for why no potent groups, right angle Artin groups, mapping class groups, all act on the circle or the interval in uh, an appropriate way. Yes. When there are no punctures. When there are no punctures, we uh, do not know. That, that, uh, so Ty actually, Brought that up as an open problem. Yeah. So the last one gives you two action, one on each side, or yeah, you, uh, I mean they're yeah. So you, <clears throat> so the I mean the, the, so somehow the way you, if you have a boundary component, then there's one part that's flaring, and uh, so that's the the flaring part is is here, right? And so. The, probably the better better place to look is on on this uh, on this side, right? But you still, I think you still get a faithful action on the other side because there are like other lifts of the boundary here, and so it, it doesn't really matter. But but yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> I started this whole discussion uh, as being about the uh, effect of regularity on. Uh, on the actions of, of, of groups on the real, on, on the interval and on the circle. So let's investigate that a little bit. So no potent groups are, uh, I mean, okay, so if I, if I give you some ordering on the Heisenberg group and I ask you now, does this arise from a smooth action of the Heisenberg on, on the interval? I don't know, it's, that's, it, seems, it seems like, the definition of a of a left order or a circular order is not really suited 
for answering a question like that. But we'll come back to that in just a moment. So what about this particular action that I've drawn of the free group? So is this action smooth? Well, I already told you that it's smooth if you allow uh, the domain to be the real line. But what if I compactified it? So what if I had, what if this were an action on the interval? So can you make such an action smooth? Well, uh, the answer is no, uh, it is not smooth. So let me explain why. That may seem strange at first because I already told you that you have a lot of freedom in choosing what A and B are. And so why don't you just choose them to be things that are smooth and like the derivatives sort of converge to, to the identity nicely enough at zero and at one. Well, the problem is that then the action will not be faithful if you do something like that. Because what you really need is you need a point in each of these intervals to get moved some definite proportion of the way across this interval. And that is an essential obstruction to uh, differentiability. So, one thing that you may uh, may notice immediately is that, um, so look at this particular action of, of F2 into homeo, uh, homeo plus of the interval. Okay. So pictures like this are going to have to repeat themselves infinitely often. There is no way that you will, that you can just check Finitely many words are not the identity, and then therefore the whole group acts faithfully. There's actually a bit of content hidden in what I just said there, but but uh, maybe you just trust me on that for now. <clears throat> and so, if you have look at the the interval like this, then you have these intervals where A is acting or where B is acting, and there are like infinitely many of these bumps. And so they, they accumulate somewhere at, a, at, a, at least one point in the interval because the interval is compact. Okay. So let's suppose that A acts by a diffeomorphism. So then, at the, so then the, the value of that, the derivative has to be something at that accumulation point. And what is it? Well, each of these endpoints of these green bumps is a fixed point of A. And so one finds that if you look at, you know, all right, A prime of an accumulation point of fixed points, this has to be equal to one. That follows from the mean value theorem. Uh, so I'll, I won't work that particular thing out, but I'll show you why, if you know this, that A prime cannot possibly be continuous if it has to move points across each, each interval in the domain a definite amount. So, so let's say you have some interval here of length L. Imagine this is, you know, this is a magnified image of this particular interval here. And now you have some X here. And here is A of X. And this is a definite proportion, say pi times L, a different definite proportion of the length of, uh, of, of this interval. So here pi just be greater than zero. So let's play a game with the mean value theorem. And so if I, uh, I'll pretend that this is, so I can do arithmetic better. I'll just pretend that this is zero on, on the real line, okay? So then if I compute uh, A of X minus zero divided by X minus zero, that is the derivative at some point in the interior. This is A prime of, of Y for some point in, in the interior of this, this interval. Well, this is at least x plus pi l 
over x, which is at least one plus pi, because x is at most L. And so this is bounded away for one. So if you have points getting moved a definite amount in each of these intervals of the support, then the derivative has to keep bouncing up above one infinitely often. And then at the accumulation point, it has to, the derivative has to actually be equal to one and that violates the continuity of the derivative. So this is sort of the basic observation, which makes a study of right angled Arden groups from the point of view of dynamics and smoothness possible. So we'll more on that later. So, yes. So does this exclude infinitely many of those two words, uh, or even with this method for excluding one word? Uh, it's because of them. So you, you can make any finite collection of words survive in a smooth action. Using this. Yes, using the, that, that, that example that I did, did there. So again, more on that later too. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> okay. So what about mapping class groups? Okay, so can, are those actions, like is, is Nielsen's action smooth? Well, no, it's not. Uh, the reason is a little bit tricky to see. If, if sigma is complicated enough, I, I won't say what that means. So then, then Nielsen's action of, of mod sigma is not smooth. And the main the technical guts of, of, of a justification for why this is true is a result called thirst instability, which itself arises from the study of foliations. It says that if you look at uh, <clears throat> the group of, uh, of diffeomorphisms of the half closed interval, then this group is locally indicable. So basically what you get is you, you can find like a sub mapping class group, which fixes a point inside of the circle. And, that, and then we can prove using algebraic methods that this sub mapping class group has no surjective homomorphisms to Z. And so it fails local indicability. And, but, and so then if, therefore this action itself cannot be by, by diffeomorphism. It's not even conjugate to an action by diffeomorphisms. Okay. You could repeat the condition that implies local indicability. Ah, so uh, so just being in diff one of closed zero open one, this is is locally indicable. That is what what the first improved. So uh, that that's that, that that's that's the main reason that uh, Nielsen's action is not smooth. Okay. So my God, that's the time. Um, so I'm like one third of what I had planned for this lecture. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, no potent groups. So what helps us when we study no potent groups? No potent uh, is like uh, al almost abelian. So that means that there are lots of commutation relations inside of no potent groups. Like or we already saw that with the Heisenberg group, which I, uh, whose presentation I, I erased, like you have this central copy of the integers and a generator is uh, of that Z is a commutator of two generators of the Heisenberg group. So, uh, so what's the sort of mantra that one could say about studying regularity and nilpotent groups? It's basically that, that commutation uh, is difficult uh, uh, smoothly. So how can two diffeomorphisms of, of say the interval commute with each other? Well, one thing that you can do is you can, so Matt, you can have the interval like this, and you can have you know, A and B. And so if their if their supports are disjoint, then they commute with each other. Great. That's certainly not the only way. So another way that two diffeomorphisms can commute is, for example, 
if you uh, have some maybe one parameter flow, a, a sub t, maybe t r, a flow. So at any two stopping times, you get two diffeomorphisms that, that commute with each other. That's the, by the definition of what a flow is. And maybe another slightly less obvious thing that you can do is like you have one homeomorphism here on top, and then you have a bunch of uh, intervals in here. Uh, and these are all the support of B. And so what A does is it just shifts over one. And then when you, so this, the way that, that B acts on this interval is just conjugated how, how it acts here by A. So that's, so if you just then extend this out, like of course it has to go out infinitely up to this accumulation point and down to this accumulation point. If you extend it infinitely in both directions, then you get two homeomorphisms that commute with each other. So, I mean, most other things that you might try to do uh, will result in homeomorphisms that don't commute with each other. Uh, one of my favorite pictures, I make a lot of false claims, well, it's my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> so here's one, maybe here's A and here's, Here's B, and they overlap like this. So you can sort of verify directly just by playing around with, with orbits of points that, uh, uh, that, that these two homeomorphisms in this configuration of supports will never commute with each other. And you might even guess that, oh, you probably get a free group, but you don't actually. So usually this is, so if, if these, points get moved by A and B quickly enough, then you actually get a copy of, of Thompson's group F. These are just any two homeomorphisms with this support. Uh, uh, provided that they move quickly enough. And, the, and so precisely what I mean by that is that if you take this point X and you and A moves it here, and then you take B and it, it gets moved to the right of this point. So this is BAX. If, it's, if, if BAX is to the right of this endpoint, then you get Thompson's group F, no matter what A and B were which is very, very strange. Okay. Uh, right, so the, maybe if, if there was some like good conceptual understanding of, of why this is the case, then uh, that would give us some insight into the structure of F. But so the, the way that one proves this is that one writes down a very specific uh, presentation for F with two generators and, and two relations, right? And one simply just verifies that those two relations hold provided that this dynamical condition holds. And then one shows that in Thompson's group F, all non-trivial quotients are abelian. And because th this group is not, not abelian, then it has to then that the, the map from F to this group is isomorphism it, it it doesn't help at all <laughs> uh, so it's um maybe it sounds cooler than it is <laughs> okay it doesn't make your list of favorite things <laughs> no I, this is uh when i first learned that fact that was absolutely mind-blowing to me actually uh, i i went from not really caring about Thompson's group to caring about it but, but a lot. Thompson's <laughs> group. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. Very much not. <laughs> this is being recorded. No, it is not, it is not my group. <laughs> okay, so I'm uh I'm gonna have to finish uh, my discussion of nilpotent groups tomorrow, but let me at least give a bit of a, a setup and, and I've said some things that it imply that the commutation is kind of the, uh, the essential feature uh, that one should uh, that one should zone uh, one should um, zoom in on uh, in order to uh, understand nilpotent groups from the point of regularity. So, uh, so there's the following uh, result, which is called Cal's lemma, in its most original formulation, though there are uh, several other 
uh, weakenings of the hypotheses that one can put, so strengthenings of the result, which uh, most notably are probably due to Andres, and also there, there are some uh, accounts due to uh, Danny Caligari and uh, some other authors as well. Uh, and so what, so it may be in its most straightforward formulation. So you take, so let F and G be elements of, of diff two plus of zero one, uh, such that uh, F and G commute. So now suppose that the following two conclusions are hold. First is that if you look at the fixed points of F, so just the points that are not moved by F, and you intersect this with the interior of the interval, and this is empty. So F moves every point in the interior either to the right or to the left. And the second is that fixed G intersect zero one is not empty. So G fixes at least one point, it need not change directions. So just going back to this picture, uh, that I, uh, pictures that I drew here. So, so this could be like F, right? So if, if zero were here and one were here, then you're, this could be F and this could be G. This is an example of maybe two things that commute, but where there's a fixed point of G in the interior. But Pell's lemma tells us that this never happens when G is the identity. Okay. So, Maybe if uh, I'll see how I feel about what, uh, where things are going tomorrow, and maybe I'll give a sketch of the proof of this, but uh, likely not. I mean, it, in the end, it, it really does boil down to arguments with the mean value theorem. So the mean value theorem makes it hard for diffeomorphisms to commute with each other. This is the lesson that one should take. From this. Okay, so maybe the last thing I'll say now, uh, and which I'll justify tomorrow, is the following result, which is due to, to plant to Thurston, uh, which makes critical use of, of Capel's lemma. And that's that, um, so if, if N is a subgroup of diff two of I or diff two, S1, uh, so if this is nilpotent, then N is abelian. That kind of answers our, well, one of our questions to some degree. Like, can a particular left invariant order or a circular order on the Heisenberg group come from a smooth action? Well, no, uh, not if that action is required to be C2, although it might be C1. So there's a uh, there's a theorem that uh, so there this is this combines the work of of many many people. So the uh, names that that should go here are, are Arke, uh, uh, Castro, Vera, uh, uh, Navas, uh, Rivas. To contribute to parts of this, at least the way I'm stating it here, so that so let let m let m uh, be either the interval or the circle, uh, and let let n be uh, a, a torsion-free group with uh, maybe I'll write it inside of. Uh, homeo plus M, so they don't have to worry about like actual embedding problems. Uh, uh, a torsion free group with um, uh, with growth uh, at most uh, uh, O of N to the D. And so this means that this is a group of polynomial growth. That is to say, if you look at, you take a, fix a finite generating set for it, and you look at balls of radius n, then asymptotically these grow like polynomials of, of power at most d. So then, then n is topologically conjugate into, uh, right, into what? Diff plus 
one tau of m we're here uh, uh we're this is true for all tau less than one over d so what do i mean by this okay so the, by this i mean diffeomorphisms of m whose derivatives are tau holder continuous so let me just say what that that means all right so so if f is in if one tau and this implies that that if you look at uh f prime uh that this is is uh is tau holder continuous in other words that uh for all uh x and y you have that of x minus f of y where i'm justified in using this additive notation if you look at the circle as r mod z at least this is bounded by some absolute constant c uh, x minus y to the tau. So it's sort of like Lipschitz, except with this exponent, which is uh, generally, well, it's between zero and one. So I think I'm out of time. I'll, I'll continue with this discussion tomorrow. Maybe I missed this, but you said for the Writing or writing groups, the examples you gave don't embed into the PO of the integral. Are there other ways to embed them into pure the integral? Is that no one? So, um, yeah, so so you could actually use a variation of this theorem to, plus the residual torsion free nilpotence to say that they act by by C1 diffeomorphisms. Oh, this this tau is the, so for is the, the, the degree of nilpotence that you need to take is going to be sort of unbounded. Right, so so tau is actually going to have to tend to zero. So you could get like diff one zero, but um, but it, it but it cannot be diff two. But that's that that's coming. Yeah. Usually, I mean sometimes it can. I mean a free group can act by C infinity diffeomorphisms, but most right angle art groups cannot. Be able to distinguish groups when you replace I by something non compact by R if you're just looking at diffeomorphisms of R. Distinguish any subgroups or uh, that's very, very, that's a very hard question. Yeah, I, yeah. so things a lot of wild things can happen. At, so, I don't know. Uh, there, are, I mean, so, like, uh, from the point of point of view of the particular groups that you're considering, like right angle darting groups, like you, uh, you, you can embed all of them in, in infinity. Um, so is there a group that's known to embed the polio of the of R, but not in the width? No, I don't, I, not that I know of, uh, not, nothing comes to mind. Um, so if you could prove, for example, that like uh, grade groups cannot act uh, virtually by like diffeomorphisms of the polio line, then you would be able to prove results like that braid groups are not virtually special or something like that. I don't know how to do that. I tried and failed. Uh, you distinguish subgroups of diff diffeomorphism group of all R uh, versus homeomorphism group of all R. Uh, Compatible subgroups. Compatible subgroups. I, I don't. I don't know. I, I may be just blanking now because I'm I'm at uh, at the board, but I no, nothing comes to mind. In general. Oh, yeah. One example, sure. I mean, Michaela will give us a list, yes. Great example. I, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I go, go, yeah. go ahead. Um, we talk about it later. Um, yeah, that would be but still, you can build the groups like the uh, piecewise project in the homomorphism of, of, with uncountable, with uh, countably many great points. Okay. Okay. Then. Stability. Yeah, I like that. It must be a silly trick that makes it true. Is either a converse? Is there some sort of characterization of local stability uh, along those lines? No, no. Um, so uh, Andres gave an example of a, of a group that is locally indicable but admits no C uh, no C one actions. And along those. Types of lines? Uh, not, not that I know of. I mean, so one thing that I 
like to do is to be able to like write down some characterization of multiple groups that act by diffeomorphisms of say the interval of this or the circle but uh, right now that's it's most uh, most embryonic stages so uh, no real no no real idea this community doesn't i mean they seem like they would like like to understand classes of things and characterizations and so forth yeah that's not a natural that's not a natural question that people have I think, it's a, I think it's a natural question, but I, I think it's just it's, it's there, there, there's no answer as far as I know. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Dale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>